last week on The Climate of Middle Earth. Professor Dan Lunt, a climate scientist from the University of Bristol, embarked on a quest to simulate the climate of Middle Earth. You know, ever since I've been a child, I've been really into the Tolkien books. I've probably read them, you know, tens of, tens of times, if not, if not more. But one does not simply model the climate of Middle Earth. Assumptions were made. Dragons like sm Smorg and um, the uh, activities of, of the wizards and, and Sauron, for example, may well have raised the CO2 level on Middle Earth. Once Lunt had built his climate model, it was time to run the simulation and see what his climate model would produce. I was amazed actually, it was mainly because I spent so much time doing these past climate works, actually in the end I was able to pretty much finish, set up the simulations in one evening. Although it was a very long evening, it was more like an evening and a morning, but because um, I got quite into it. However, real world issues also presented their own challenges. It was in my spare time, it wasn't funded, but I did run, them on, run the simulations on the university supercomputer which is free to use by members of the university for research purposes. So I didn't tell anyone I was doing it actually, but I did get to a point where I thought maybe if people who were, you know, trying to discover a cure for cancer or something might get a bit annoyed that I was running Middle Earth simulations. <laughs> After Lunt had completed his simulation, next he had to interpret the results. An important part of understanding what climate models can tell us is recognising their limitations. Now the model can't actually tell you anything about the climate on a scale that is smaller than one of these grid boxes. And so what that means, however, these grid boxes typically are maybe um, the very highest resolution models are perhaps the order of tens of kilometres, but most models you're talking hundreds of kilometres. So there are lots of processes in the atmosphere in particular that actually occur in reality on a much smaller scale than that. For example, clouds themselves are much smaller than the size of one of these grid boxes. And so we have to make approximations to how some of those processes work. Interpreting his model results presented its own challenges. Lunt took an innovative approach to making sense of the data. A useful way of sort of interpreting that, the model output really, was to ask the question what some of these places in Middle Earth, how their climate resembled places in our Earth. And so, for example, I chose a, a few places in Middle Earth. So we started off with the Shire, with its rolling hills and, you know, it's a very green, uh, very nice part of uh, Middle Earth. And, and so I thought, well, what is the model predicts the climate of the Shire? How does that compare with the real Earth? And in, and in particular, I knew that the recent film had been, a lot of that had been, or if not all, had been shot in New Zealand. And so I was very interested as to whether the right choice had been made and whether the Shire's climate really was like that of New, New Zealand, for example. So I actually made a map of the world, our Earth, and highlighted all those regions that had a climate similar to that of the Shire. And so we found out, for example, that there were parts of New Zealand that had a climate very similar to that of the Shire, but actually they were nearly all in the South Island and it was the, apparently the film was filmed in the North Island. So it was out by a few hundred miles, maybe. Apparently, um, Tolkien envisaged the Shire as being, as being similar, at least, to parts of the UK. And in fact, we found that Leicestershire and Nottinghamshire do have a very similar climate to that of the Shire, if you believe the climate model. After doing the Shire, we were obviously interested in other places. And in particular, we thought, well, Mordor is a very well-known part of Middle Earth. It's where the evil Sauron lives. It's very black and desolate. And um, so we tried to find places in the real earth that were like Mordor and actually somewhat to my delight we found that Los Angeles in the US had a climate almost identical to that of Mordor. Also parts of Australia I think um, Alice Springs and also had a very Mordor like climate. At the time when I did this England were actually down under in Australia playing cricket against Australia and I thought and actually one of the test matches that we lost was almost right bang in the middle of the most Mordor-like climate. So I think that almost certainly explained our whitewash by the Aussies this year. <laughs> an interesting finding from Lunt's climate model was an alternative scientific explanation of how the elves left Middle-earth. An interesting place in Middle-earth is somewhere called the Greyhavens, which is just on the west coast of Middle-earth. 
And it's a place where, in the books, it, it turns out that the elves, when they leave Middle-earth and go back to their, their homeland, if you like, they, they set sail um, from the Grey Havens and go west um, to their own country. And actually, some of the, the main characters in Lord of the Rings are actually not elves, but uh, Frodo and, and Sam and in, apparently also uh, Gimli and Legolas also set sail for the west. And actually, we found that one of the reasons why they might have set sail from the Grey Havens is actually, it turns out, our model predictions was that we had very strong easterly winds, that is, blowing towards the west, um, at the region of the Grey Haven. So that explains why they left from there and not, for example, further south from um, uh, somewhere in the west of Gondor, for example. Tolkien wrote about walking, talking trees called Ents. Lunt's climate model offered a possible new interpretation of Tolkien's Ents. There's a, a lot of discussion in the Lord of the Rings book about the Ents um, moving and actually, so these are the trees moving. Actually in the books it says that they were looking for their wives, the Ent wives, and that they travelled vast distances. And actually what our work perhaps suggests is that perhaps the real reason they moved was that they were trying to move to more uh, climates that were more suitable for them, for them to, to flourish and grow. So it, we certainly found, and actually in the real world there are, in our earth, there are cases and it's something that's predicted by models where trees will actually move in a similar way to the Ents did, but they will be moving in response to climate change rather than looking for their wives. Next week, Nunn will face a challenge that confronts all scientists, communicating the results of his scientific research to the public. I originally intended it would be quite short, but in the end I think it's one of the longest papers I've ever written. <laughs> He will explain how his climate model helped find a piece of Middle Earth in our own world. Just outside Alice Springs, there is a region known as Mordor Pound because in the 70s, some geologists were there and thought the climate and just the, the whole feel of the place was so like Mordor from Tolkien's books that they named it Mordor Pound. And Lunt will explain his greatest regret in simulating the climate of Middle Earth. I got lots of complaints about the fact that I hadn't done that properly. So for all those people, I do apologise. Find out more next week in the climate of Middle Earth. That explains why they left from there and not, for example, further south from um, uh, somewhere in the west of Gondor, for example. That's awesome. <laughs> he did, if you read the appendices, if you read the appendices, he did actually, yeah. I only watched the movie, so... Yeah, that happened, that, that happens, that happens that after, actually, yeah. He does too, you're right. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> I, I, I yeah, it's big, it's geeky, it's geeky, geeky appendix knowledge, I'm afraid. <laughs>